Barry Everett heads the experimental psychology department at Cambridge University, where he studies the role of dopamine in compulsive drug use. So what's interesting about those drugs is they directly affect the operation of this dopamine system. But opiates like heroin and morphine, they interact with their own uh, target in the brain, which is not a, a dopamine neuron receptor or target. They interact with things called opiate receptors. Nicotine, just its very name, tells you that nicotine interacts with a nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. Cannabis interacts with a cannabinoid receptor. Alcohol interacts with lots of things, but among them NMDA and GABA receptors. So each different class of drug has its own different chemical target in the brain. And one of the big prevailing theories about why all drugs are addictive, even though they come from different classes, is that through their primary and different pr uh, sites of action, those actions converge on that dopamine system. So one way or the other, dopamine goes up in the brain. When stimulated by cocaine, dopamine doesn't just go anywhere in the brain. It concentrates in the limbic brain, around the striatum, and especially in the nucleus accumbens. Studies of this tiny but crucial area over the last 10 years have created a small revolution in the neurosciences. The nucleus accumbens is generally thought to be the pleasure center, which is stimulated by dopamine. compared to other sources of reward and indeed subjective feelings of, of pleasure, like eating or drinking or sex. Clearly, what you do when you're engaged in those behaviours is really quite different. You, you seek the object of your motivation, you seek food, you seek water, you seek sex, and then you engage in a particular kind of behaviour, like eating, with all of the things that happen when you eat, you taste things and you swallow them and you ingest them and glucose is released. And it's believed that at some point in that sequence, and it may be from the very first time you put the food in your mouth, you change the activity of the dopamine system and that's been measured. So the idea with drugs then is that you don't have any of these what are often called consummatory behaviours where you put things in your mouth and eat and chew or drink or engage in sexual activity copulation, the, the short-circuiting is that this goes in your arm in a vein or through your nose as smoke, and it hits that dopamine system directly and quickly without any of those other preliminaries. And hence this idea of hijacking the brain's reward system. <laughs> In the presence of cocaine, dopamine remains active in the synapses 300 times longer than in a normal state. Some studies have shown that such an avalanche of dopamine in the brain of cocaine addicts eventually damages their dopamine receptors. Although they may be self-repairing, they never regain their original efficiency even after years of abstinence. Such neurological damage can result in symptoms of depression and attention deficit problems. Under cocaine, 
The dopamine-flooded brain is conditioned to seek the same sensation over and over again. According to neurobiologist Wolfram Schultz, the nucleus accumbens interprets it as a reward signal. The nucleus accumbens seems to be a structure that's more activated with rewards than the rest of the striatum uh, through its dopamine projection. If one looks at the human brain and presents the human with a very nice rewarding picture uh, or with a picture of a 10-pound bill, um, the nucleus accumbens will get very nicely activated. And that is due to the activation of the dopamine system coming into the nucleus accumbens. The striatum gets also activated through reward, but a little bit less. A reward can be a liquid, it can be food, it can be a somatosensory stimulus, a visual stimulus, it can be all kinds, it can be nice music. There's no specific um, sensory system for reward. A reward is defined by behavior and has maybe three major functions. The first function may be, for example, that um, one comes back for more when one encounters a reward. I press a button on a, on, a, on a machine, I don't know what happens, and the Coke comes out. And assuming that I like the Coke, I do it again. And um, so this is the learning function of reward. I Uh, the second function is if one um, encounters a reward that one recognizes as such, one approaches, one goes towards the reward. From a punisher one would go away, from a reward one would cl go close. So one would say approach behavior is the second, generating approach behavior is the second function of rewards. And the third function is what many people think as a major function, it's the emotional function, it makes you happy. You get a reward and it has hedonic, the reward has hedonic properties, it makes you happy, you like it and you feel positive emotion about it. The general public discovered the hedonistic qualities of cocaine in the 1890s at the same time as the invention of the cinematograph. For quite some time, it was sold over the counter. It soon conquered artists, Hollywood stars, and nightclubbers. It was even recommended as a wonder drug by a young Dr. Sigmund Freud. But cocaine was especially popular as a drink in the famous cocoa wine Vin Mariani, whose fans included sports champions, well-known writers, and Pope Leo XIII. Coca-Cola, until 1903, contained cocaine and was promoted as an invigorating drink and a tonic for the brain. Cocaine was finally banned worldwide in 1914. As long as you don't bring any people, any person, into contact with, addiction, with drugs of addiction, they won't get addicted. But if you bring a hundred people with drugs in, in contact with drugs of addiction, some of them will get addicted. And with different drugs, different proportions will get addicted. And the difference is in the brain, quite clearly. Whether that is pathological, whether that is normal variation, I don't think it makes much of a difference. It's, it's all the same thing. It's, it's a, a, a spectrum of different brain function that is disturbed by drugs and in some cases the brain won't take it and the person gets addicted. In other cases it goes away without a problem. And that is not just simply the anatomy of the brain, that's the environment, that's the social context, that's the, uh, the past history of the individual. Um, that's the living circumstances, it's the way they eat and drink, it's a lot of factors that come together. Um, one could say in some cases that it's really like schizophrenia, a real brain disorder, and there are indications for that. That's a possibility, I really don't know. So to me the most important uh, consequence of my work has been it has helped conceptualize drug addiction as a disease of the brain where there's clear abnormalities on the way that the brain functions that translate in this case in disrupted behavior. If you have abnormalities on the, way, on the function of your heart, it translates into improper circulation, which is very easy to understand for people and nobody would question that if you have a myocardial infarction, you have a heart disease. Everybody will question 
if you have abnormal behavior because you've been taking drugs, whether you have a disease, because that, their, their immediate response is the person chooses to take drugs. So it's a choice that the individual does. <laughs> Well, I, I think there are people in a better position than me to give definitions of addiction. But if you ask me for my personal um, uh, opinion, then it's an, an uncontrolled reward process or a reward process that you cannot control by yourself or that for some reason you don't want to control by yourself because the reward is so immense that it overruns every other reward. And in that case, it's still somewhat controlled or not. And that leads, of course, to the question of how much you are in control of your own decisions and actions. Certain abnormalities in brain circuits could explain why some people are attracted to drugs, unable to resist temptation, or slaves to their impulses. This is an experiment that's actually um, used very often in, in, uh, in humans, which is to do with measuring one aspect of impulsivity which is the ability to uh, wait for bigger and better rewards. And, and you, I think you said biscuit now or cake later. So you can give an individual a choice between a small immediate reward, it could be a small immediate reward of money, or a large delayed reward. And but some individuals with a particular kind of impulsivity seek immediate gratification and can't wait for bigger and better rewards later on. And we don't know very much about that at a neurobiological level, but it seems that damage to the nucleus accumbens promotes uh, impulsivity in that kind of setting, that individuals with damage to the nucleus accumbens can't wait for large, delayed rewards. Raphael These lesions in the dopamine pathways can result in real pathologies, this aggressive little boy, filmed back in the 70s, would probably be diagnosed by doctors with an attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, more commonly known as ADHD. The characteristics of this disorder are aggressiveness, strong impulsivity, and inattention. There is another aspect to this, which is, as you know, um, particularly in the US, but everywhere now, uh, individuals with ADHD are uh, treated with a stimulant to control their HD, like Ritalin. Now, Ritalin is an amphetamine-like compound. It has many different qualities. Now, amph amphetamines are psychomotor stimulants. So here you have the paradox of a psychomotor stimulant being used to decrease what is overactivated behavior. In the United States, four to five million school children are undergoing this kind of treatment and it is rapidly gaining ground in Europe. In the brain, medications like Ritalin maintain high levels of dopamine by blocking its reuptake a technique which resembles that of cocaine. Half and a whole one. The half and a whole one. All right. 